Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 13th, 2019, and my guest is cardiologist and author Eric Topol, founder and director of the Scripps Research Translational Institute and professor and executive vice president of Scripps Research. He is the former leader of the Cleveland Clinic and the founder of the medical school there. This is his third appearance on Econ Talk, having appeared in April 2013 and May 2015 to discuss two of his books. His latest book, the topic of today's episode, is Deep Medicine, How Artificial Intelligence Can Make Healthcare Human Again. Eric, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. A real joy to be with you. What do you mean by deep medicine? So deep medicine is really three separate layers, the first of which is deep phenotyping, which refers to getting all the relevant information, the medical essence about a person, about that individual. Then deep learning to take all that data, to process it, learn from it, so that we can do a far better job, more accurate, more more ideal for the person's prevention, uh, their management of conditions and their outcomes. And that would get us to the state of deep empathy, which is enhancing the human bond the patient-doctor relationship, uh, by the use of technology, this counterintuitive sense that technology can enhance humanity. And you argue, and I certainly agree, that right now there's some barriers between the doctor and the patient being caused by uh, technology. We're going to come to that later, but I want to contrast your definition of deep medicine with what you call shallow medicine, and you, you argue that's what we're practicing now. What do you mean by shallow medicine? What's wrong with, in a well, yeah, in under an hour? What's wrong right. with our current medical practice? <laughs> right. Well, it's it's sad, and we haven't really fessed up to it, Russ. That we have so many errors, over twelve million serious diagnostic errors a year. We've got uh, the problems of insufficient time, insufficient context, insufficient presence. So the average appointment is uh, seven minutes for a return visit, 12 minutes for a new visit, totally inadequate. And we know that the mistakes are being made, no less the lack of real connection, the human connection. So altogether, uh, we have this burnout of doctors because during those limited minutes, they're pecking away at a keyboard, typically. They're data clerks. So we have burnout and depression at peak levels. We know that burnout doubles the rate of medical errors. So we've got a recipe here when you put it all together of a horrendous lack of care, the lack of humanity, empathy, compassion, all the qualities like presence, trust, all the things we used to have 40 years ago before medicine became a big business and clinicians were squeezed to the hill. Now, your book's about artificial intelligence, um, and I can't help but notice in that summary of what's wrong with today's situation that most of those things that you mention, um, empathy and others, are not quantifiable. But the revolution that is promised for artificial intelligence is a revolution based on data, uh, quantification of aspects of of human uh, health and various interventions into that health and the results of those interventions. So we're going to come back at the end and talk about uh, the potential for empathy to be uh, important again in in medicine. But in the meanwhile, there's a lot of excitement, maybe too much, (laughs) about what uh, machine learning and big data can bring to to medicine. And, And much of your book, your book's a phenomenal survey of where we stand in that in that potential revolution. But I have to say that one of the things I got from your book is that much of that revolution has been overhyped. Would you say that so far? Would you say that's accurate? That's absolutely true, Russ, that there's very few prospective studies 
that is in a clinical environment. What we have mostly relying upon this long on promise, short on proof, are these retrospective data sets. Sometimes, you know, very large, sometimes even millions of people in them. But that's a very different matter when you have this kind of buttoned up in silico demonstration of impact as compared to going forward in a real world uh, environment in medicine where things aren't so uh, pristine, more challenging. And so we only have a very limited handful of studies that have been in this prospective category. So that's why there's lots of excitement, but we're missing lots of validation. And so hopefully over time, we'll start to see that gap uh, close because otherwise uh, we've got a, a just a inordinate amount of hype associated with AI in medicine so far. Yeah, I, I was giving a talk the other day and somebody said, uh, boy, it's amazing what Watson has done for cancer diagnosis. And I thought, hmm, I just talked to somebody who was David Epstein's book. Uh, I've read his book, Range, where he said that the Watson uh, diagnostic attempts were a debacle, a debacle, and that you know, that we had to tone down a lot of the original enthusiasm. But I think a lot of people didn't get that second message. They got the first one. <laughs> yeah, well, there's probably no company among the tech titans uh, as IBM, as I wrote in the book, that has been out there uh, uh, promoting, hyping things that they have not accomplished. And the Watson Oncology Cancer Product has really never uh, delivered as it had promised. The only thing it's done, which doesn't even need AI, is match up patients with potential clinical trials of experimental drugs. But that is far from what we have hopes for eventually. Uh, we'll see not just, of course, in cancer, but across all uh, aspects of medicine and healthcare. Let's start with cancer diagnosis. What was the, what was the hope, at least at the time, uh, when Watson was Watson being a large supercomputer with some ideally some machine learning and other types of uh, techniques to improve diagnostics, uh, what was the hope, and why did it fall short? As far as you can tell, well, the hope would be to uh, have the data of a person all culled together and crystallize for the clinician and, of course, ultimately for the patient. So that would mean taking their electronic health record data, their pathology data from a biopsy, uh, their uh, scan data, uh, genomic data, if they have sequencing of the tumor, put all that together and help with the uh, analysis to come up with the best therapy. Uh, so that fell apart because... Uh, initially, IBM did a big project with MD Anderson, one of the country's leading cancer hospitals, and they couldn't even get past the electronic health record uh, side because, as it turns out, that th the records we have today, these hallowed, and I use that in quotes, electronic health records, they're, they're farcical because they're cut and pasted notes. 80% uh, are cut and pasted, and they're laden just chock full of errors that go from one note to the next. And there are lots of free text that are typed in. So it's not structured. So it can't be digitized. So the, basically they were trying to do something that was not possible. And they didn't ever execute. And eventually the whole relationship with MD Anderson, who had paid tens of millions of dollars to IBM, it all fell apart. The errors that you're talking about, the cut and paste part, this I assume are uh, an, a mistake that a doctor makes in, in working on a keyboard in the presence of a patient, and then when the patient comes back, uh, cutting and pasting the same text from the last visit to save time, re thereby repeating the error, making it look like it's more it's more true even when it's not true at all. Is that is that what we're talking about? We're talking about well, errors. yes, yes, but it's even worse than that. It is that. The, the, somehow or other, the patient acquires diagnoses that they don't have or, or medications that they've never taken, and they just go from one to the next. And so what's fascinating is if you give patients the right to edit their notes, which they should have that right, uh, then you, you start getting the truth, which is, I never had that diagnosis. I never had that medication. So what happens is whenever something is entered about a patient that's erroneous, uh, it, it just Persist. gets perpetuated. Yeah, yeah. And you talked about 
the importance of patients taking control of and owning and, and having ownership of their own data in, in your previous book. And we talked about that you know, on that Econ Talk episode. I encourage listeners to go back to that. It just It's an extraordinary example of a bizarre culture, right? It, it, when I go to the get my oil changed and they put in a certain kind of oil at a certain mileage rate, a certain part of a certain level of mileage in my car, and they put a little sticker on my car to tell me when that, you know, what that mileage was at the time or when I'm due for my next time in. And uh, of course, I choose not to come back. I can, <laughs> I can t- tear the sticker off if it's grossly wrong. I can write on it. I can decide it's too early and I can come back later. But somehow, the, just the very idea that I could edit my own record is a bizarre one in our current culture of doctor patient relationship. We 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 would it it seems somehow presumptuous for me to edit my own data. <laughs> and remember data here is just a narrative. It's not really it could be data literally it could be you know what my blood pressure was or what my uh yeah uh, you know my heart rate was at a certain time but but this is also usually you know what the, you know the patient said complained of and if I if you misheard me and, and or spelled it wrong and and it's prone to to, to a dangerous misinterpretation I could just like a Google Doc theory, I should be able to just go ahead and fix it, but I can't. That's bizarre. Man, it's so frustrating, <laughs> and it's just an outgrowth of the medical paternalism. You know, doctors in control, I mean, doc, control freaks. And so we have seen evidence now. You know, this project, my open notes, that several uh, medical health systems in the country are working on, where they have started start letting the patients edit their notes. And it's been a, a huge success. The patients are happier that they don't have all these errors. Uh, they get copies of their notes. And the doctors are happy that these uh, notes, that these mistakes have been cleared up. So that should be the norm. You know, I hope we'll get there someday. It's also really important in the era of AI, because if you have wrong inputs, you're going to get bad outputs. So we've got to get this problem fixed. Well, you know, I'm talking to Dr. Topol right now, but I call you Eric. It's a bit presumptuous of me, but I mentioned that because I once had a friend who said that, that he always called her, or she always called, I can't remember what the uh, gender of the friend was, but they always called the doctor by their first name to sort of even the playing field because <laughs> the, the doctor comes and says, Russ, how are you doing? Well, thank you for asking, Dr. Topol. Uh, and the fact that I have a PhD in economics course is worth nothing when I'm in a white gown. Uh, in the uh, examining room. But it's not just the doctors who have had the paternalism. I think we as patients see the doctor as a shaman, godlike figure who's going to save us. And we don't really want to be on a first-name basis with you. And we kind of probably some of us like the idea that we don't have access to our records. That would be uh, somehow, I don't know, rebellious. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of this suppression mode that has continued uh, and the problem is when medicine became data uh, centric and it eminently portable, then at least those people who want to have their data, they should have rights to it and it should be uh, correct data. It should be it should be real. So, you know, I think we're in this transition. Uh, it's it's really going to be important to get this right because it is about ownership control. Uh, it's about accuracy of data. All these things are going to be important if we're going to ever get all that can be obtained, achieved with machine support. Uh, otherwise, it's a, it's a real compromise. And I, I, I know exactly what you're alluding to, because when I was publishing Deep Medicine, I had to have a fight with the publisher to take MD off the, 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 the cover. And the same uh, thing, I, I went through the same after thing with your the name. patient will see after you your, now. After your yeah. name, yeah. They said, oh, well, it'd be good for sales. I said, I don't care if it's good for sales. I don't want MD. I'm just, uh, you know, another person. And my patients and I are on equal footing. And maybe I have more knowledge base and experience. But the key is we got to get this thing democratized because if patients take more charge, if they have their data, they have algorithms helping them, that's going to make life better for everybody. But that re- requires this less control freak uh, d- on the doctor side and willingness to let patients take on uh, this responsibility, which they're not all, but so many are eager to ha- have that uh, charge uh, in the, on their side. And, and we're going to empower them if they so choose. I've mentioned my 
86 year old mom. And this is the day after Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, mom. Uh, she feels guilty getting a second opinion. I said, why? She said, well, it'll hurt the doctor's feelings. I said, but your life is at stake. Does that count at all? <laughs> and I suspect yeah. there's a generational aspect to this. I assume younger patients are more willing and eager to take charge. It is true. There isn't any question there's an age gradient, but it is intimidating because a lot of patients feel like if they question and get second opinions, they're going to somehow get uh, a lesser uh, form of of care and not, you know, just not get that that bond that they seek. So there is still a problem irrespective of age. But but you're absolutely right. Older people are generally uh, used to paternalism and they're not going to question it. In a normal world, a uh, a doctor would get a market edge uh, and find it useful marketing to tell his or her patients that uh, that the doctor goes and gets a second opinion for you, right? I'm sure there's different there are many many difficult diagnoses where you ask a colleague for insight, but it'd be an interesting model to have a clinic where you routinely ask for a second opinion that the doctor did that and the patient didn't have to. Right. That's the way it should be. And a lot of the mistakes that are being made are because those second opinions are not obtained. And that's where, again, this machine algorithm support in lieu of a doctor and perhaps even better than a second or multiple opinions can help bring us to a higher plane of accuracy. Let's talk about radiology and imaging. Uh, you quote someone in your book, I can't remember, but someone says uh, we shouldn't be training radiologists anymore because they're soon going to be obsolete. Uh, this appears to be one of the areas where uh, machine learning and AI have made some real inroads and are, are quite successful. Uh, talk about what's going on in radiology. Right. Well, the quote you uh, mention is from Jeffrey Hinton, who is the father of deep learning, who recently received the Turing Prize, which, as you know, is like the Nobel Prize of computer science. Uh, and that, of course, is erroneous as much as I have the highest regard for Jeffrey Hinton and his colleagues who ushered in this deep learning. The problem is, is that radiologists are going to be needed and, and there's AI is going to help them. It's not going to replace them. So, Let's just look at the data for medical scans and note that over 30% of scans read today by human radiologists, 30% have a false negative. They miss something. That's a pretty big rate of false negatives. And that rate can be brought down, maybe not to zero, but to a very low single digit number with deep learning of the scans. So we've already seen that across the board, largely in these retrospective data sets, but whether it's chest x-rays or CT scans or uh, MRI scans, ultrasound scans, whatever you name it, the accuracy rate has been markedly enhanced by having deep learning algorithmic interpretation first and then um, the eyes of the radiologist. So that's where we're headed. Uh, that will help. Uh, us get to um, this machine uh, and human symbiosis, which is what we're after. But the other thing it introduces, Russ, is what will the radiologist do with all this extra time since the pre-screening, the, the primary review is done by the machine? And, you know, I think that opens up some really exciting opportunities. And talk about what those are, because you know, it reminded me, I, I don't think you mentioned it in the book, but uh, it's my understanding don't know it's true, but it's my understanding that a uh, chess program, the best chess program in the world can beat the best human chess player, but the best human working with the chess program can beat the best program working by itself. And it struck me that this would be an area that might be analogous, that the uh, radiologist using some human art could supplement the uh, narrow analytical ability of the of the uh, reading of the x-ray or the scan. You think that's a, a good analogy? And if so, uh, what's going on? What would be the nature of that added synergy or complementarity? Yeah, it's a perfect analogy. And I know Gary Kasparov uh, would agree with that. So the idea is proven now, I think unequivocally, that machines can see things 
that humans can't, that humans will never see. Uh, perhaps the best example, again, is a medical scan of the retina. And if I show pictures of the retina to the retinal international expert, and I say, is this from a male or a female? The chance of them getting it right is 50%. But if I put that through a deep learning algorithm, I can get to 97% accuracy. So there's certain features that a machine can see that humans can't. Now, on the other hand, if, if machines are trained to find pulmonary nodules on a chest X-ray or wrist fractures or whatever, they're trained for that specific purpose. But the radiologist is looking at it in a larger context, which machines don't really have a contextual basis. So there are going to be complementarity of strengths, which is just getting at your point. And that's what's exciting beyond the fact that, you know, a lot of radiologists don't really like living in the dark basement. And what, wouldn't it be nice if they can, you know, come up out of the darkness and talk to patients? And wouldn't patients want that because, you know, they're getting, let's say, worked up for possible surgery. And they're not going to get straight talk from the surgeon, uh, but the radiologist has no vested interest in doing the procedure or the operation. And they have the expertise of having reviewed the, 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 uh, the scan. So they can be the honest brokers and helping patients and be patient advocates. And also, as you know, Russ, so many scans in the United States are unnecessary. And so radiologists could also, they don't provide this today, but they could assume a gatekeeper function and make the system more efficient. That is doing the scans uh, for, for good reason. And unnecessarily, we are exposing our population to inordinate uh, radiation, ionizing radiation, because we just have this willy-nilly approach. Again, going back to the fast appointment encounter with patients, it's easier to just get lab tests done and scans because you don't have enough time with the patient. And that's been proven. So if we have more time with patients, we'll have less scans. And if we have radiologists who are not having to spend as much time reading each scan, they can help out in, in making the whole system better. It reminds me of what I think is one of the um, uh, misunderstandings of the modern era, which is that I think a lot of people believe that more information is always better than, than less. This is a case where it's clearly not the case. Uh, and I want to miss the chance for you to talk about incidental lomas. Now, incidental lomas the word OMA at the end of a word say, sounds like a melanoma, like a cancer um, or a, a, you know, a, a growth. What's an incidental loma? Well, it's, it's like that. It's, it's a growth. Uh, you could even, some people would even characterize it as a, a cancer uh, spreading. But what it is, is when you do a test that's unnecessary, and you find something you weren't looking for, so it appears incidentally. This is a this is a serious problem throughout medicine today because we have so much overcooking, over testing, unnecessary um, uh, scans are a perfect example that we find all these things. So you have you know a cyst in the liver or the gallbladder when you're looking at some other thing that why you ordered a scan in the first place. Oh, and now we have to go work that up, and so. The problem isn't, that a, have, isn't that great? I mean, better to find it than not find it, right? <laughs> uh, well, no. I, as it turns out, uh, most of these uh, rabbit hole adventures wind up, they're very costly. They're very uh, traumatic. I mean, you have to go through biopsies and you know, sometimes other operations and all sorts of lab tests. So they're very expensive and they create tremendous anxiety uh, and almost invariably, there's nothing there. So basically it's a wild goose chase and it's good for, you know, the revenue of certain uh, medical entities, uh, people, but it's bad for patients. And we want to get rid of all these. And actually that this is getting to some fundamental economics of healthcare in the United States because we have the big inequity problems. But that's not the only reason why our healthcare is so expensive with poor outcomes. Part of it is because we overdo so much and we have these rabbit hole incidental almost stories that are so frequent. Uh, and that is where our 18 percent GDP with our de decreasing uh, life expectancy and worst 
maternal childhood and infant mortality of the whole OECD 36 countries uh, in the world. So we have a really bad business model, and part of it is rooted on overdoing things, unnecessary incidental OMA chasing. And I just can't, you know, emphasize enough the that that mantra: more information is better. It's just not all. It's all just not true all the time. And it, but but our human impulse is is um, yeah, give me the data, which is a pretty good impulse to start with, but. Uh, in other contexts, it's it's not so good. It takes away your peace of mind for starters. Also, not sure you mentioned that. Besides the biopsy and the unnecessary surgery that sometimes kills you, and the radiation that kills you later, which you don't realize yeah. is, is part of the yeah. cost of this. It's not it's not free, even if it's free out of pocket, which is part of our problem. And the people who make that decision, the doctor and me, don't bear any cost if it turns out to be unnecessary. It still has these other costs, which are harder harder to notice. Let's talk about pharma, uh, pharmaceutical discovery. Uh, about five years ago, I met someone at Stanford who was working on in this area, and I thought, boy, this is going to be such a big revolution, the ability to search for compounds and molecules in, in, in many, many times faster, exploring many, many, many times the variation that's possible than in a, a primitive standard lab setting, and yet – much of that has not produced the discoveries that certainly uh, he was promising at the time. What's the challenge there? Well, as you know, there's such a bad track record for all these uh, drug candidates that ultimately fail, whether it's because of unanticipated toxicity or lack of efficacy. Um, So we have a really big problem where there's so much research and development dollars that go into drug uh, efforts uh, and development and so little that comes out of the the funnel at the end that it really works. And that leads to these multi-billion dollars uh, per drug development program. And then we see it it reflected in these ridiculous pricing of, of new drugs. So the idea, which is not yet proven, but it, it's, it's certainly being uh, pushed on intensely with a crowded field of at least 25 companies that are in one aspect or another of using AI to accelerate, to make more efficient uh, drug discovery efforts. And it's every aspect, whether it's mining the literature all the way through simulations, uh, modeling to do far better in predicting efficacy and safety. So. It, it's encouraging. We've seen some really big uh, uh, deals out there, uh, like in Citro and, and Gilead, where some of the traditional pharma companies, biopharma, are starting to realize they ought to team up with the AI experts. But we have yet to see a new drug that's an, a true AI uh, product. So we, we're, again, this is one of those waiting for proof points, but at least there's some uh, intense effort. A friend of mine who's a chemist said, uh, when I asked him about this in prepping for this conversation, he said, we just don't know know enough about the body. It's not so much that we don't have enough data. We just don't understand how the body works. And, of course, eventually maybe the data will help us get a better grip on that. But there's just so much uh, to be discovered. And I think as lay people, we tend to assume we, quote, pretty much figured everything out, maybe the brain. But, you know, the body, we've kind of got the basics. But it's still really hard. Well, and also because we're so heterogeneous and uh, it's so you think you've understood things and then you you start to apply this in people who are of different ancestry or different comorbidities or whatever the differences are, they're all over the place and it's challenging. And so it's hard to predict. And that's a lot of what AI tries to do is to uh, is to use data uh, at depth process that and predict what's going to happen. And, you know, we'll see. I, I think the, the, the drug development, it, it's its kind of like overall healthcare. It, it's, it's so inefficient that it probably is unidirectional, probably has to get better, but uh, w- remains to be proven. Let's talk about mental health. Um, you talked about the potential for machines to uh, accurately detect depression, 70, machine learning to accurate in AI to accurately detect depression 70% of the time. And I thought that was a really nice example of one of the challenges of dealing with false positives and false negatives, which is 
How would you know what the level and num- and size of the false positive, false negative population is and, and how accurate a forecast is? I don't think we can clinically uh, define depression. So what would it mean for a machine diagnostic to be accurate 70% of the time? Well, I think it's going to get even uh, at some point much higher. And that is because up until now, we've relied on all these subjective uh I wouldn't even want to call them metrics. You know, how are you feeling? Are you down? You know, this is really soft. But now we have hard metrics uh, and multiple. So it turns out our our speech, our voice is really rich. You can tell a lot about a person's state of mind, their mood from their voice. Uh, And beyond their voice, they're breathing. So if they're breathing with lots of sighs, that would denote uh, depression. And then there's the keyboard of your smartphone where you're texting or you're, the, the strokes on the keyboard are, are very telling. No less your physical activity, how much you're communicating. Uh, you know, there's so many features that passively can be collected now with, with uh, minimal effort, with, you know, truly passive, that would give a person state of mind, which we didn't have before. So one of the interesting things, Russ, is, you know, how much of this data do we really need to be uh, uh, truly uh, getting an insightful uh, uh, score, if you will, or grade of a person's state of mind? Because it's 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 that person that we're trying to have uh, whether or not antidepressant medicine is working a dose of the medicine or other means of therapy, whether it's just increasing physical activity or or sleep or whatever it is. So what you want to do is have these metrics and then use long data. So long data, you know, serially you're assessing this. So it just has to be good enough that it really is uh, a a genuine uh, measurement for that person. And so it's still in the early days, but we didn't have objective multiple metrics before that could be seamlessly uh, captured, and now we do. So there's excitement for that. There's one other area in mental health that's unanticipated, that's especially exciting, and that's the idea that people are more comfortable to share their innermost deep secrets with an avatar instead of a human being. So that will help the cause as well, potentially. I found that extremely interesting. Um, my great grandmother, I think I wrote about this in my Adam Smith book. My great grandmother uh, was probably born in either Poland or Russia or Hungary, uh, depending on uh, what war it was after. Um, uh, you know, her joke was uh, she, she used to live in Russia, and then after uh, I think it was World War One, or the territory got renamed Poland, part of Poland, which is great because that way she didn't have any more Russian winners, but. Um, sorry, rib shot there, but um, she used to say to my father or her parents, uh, if you're depressed, go outside and talk to a rock. And I, there was a lot of folk wisdom there, right? Because there are things right. you'll say to a rock that you won't say to another person. Um, you know, it's part of what the religious impulse is. It's the idea that you're talking to something larger than yourself. Now, a rock is a little smaller than yourself, perhaps, but uh, it, it's it's an avatar that we might endow uh, irrationally with the ability to listen and uh, we can share more and sharing is might be the key, not somebody listening. I think you've nailed it. And so has your great grandmother with that. Uh, the point being is that a lot of us did not expect that there would be this um, great comfort, enhanced comfort of dealing with uh, a machine versus human in, in such a, a private matter, but it turns out it's the case. It's been replicated by many groups now. And so when you combine the ability to passively have deep learning about a person's state of mind and that feature, you start to see a path of being able to have less reliance on the lack of mental health professionals we have today. So as you well know, depression is one of the greatest uh, burdens we have of chronic illness. And it has an immense uh, impact on disability. And uh, it's something that is not supported enough because we don't have the counselors and 
uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, we, we, there's no, there's a mismatch that's profound. And it's not just, of course, depression, it's all the other mental health conditions. So the fact that we could take advantage of these new aspects uh, where we can take all this data. Uh, so you have kind of machines at two dimensions making a potential solution. It's still very early, though. And again, this like so many things we're discussing, great potential, but it has to be proven. Yeah, I think most people think incorrectly that depression is a a definable disease with symptoms that can be established in the way that cancer cells can be. And um, that's not true. Uh, as you say, it's it's often defined as the conjunction of a set of scores on a, answering a set of questions. It's not something you can do a scan of and determine. And one of the things I worry about after a conversation with Amy Webb here about uh, artificial intelligence and some of the privacy issues that I know you're worried about, you know, I can imagine that if my keyboard touches were sufficiently unenthusiastic and my tone of voice when talking to my uh, assist, my virtual assistant was sluggish or uh, low energy, that I might be put on leave from my job for my own protection, say, or required by some surveilling uh, Alexa to report in for some, and for my own good, of course, would be the claim, but I just there's some privacy issues there that are, that are very scary to me. I agree with you, and that is something that hasn't adequately been addressed. It needs to. Uh, we have to have assurance that your voice, uh, state of mind, and these other metrics are not going to be used by employers or uh, health insurers or any uh, discriminative, discriminative use. So, this is something that is not shored up, and it is one of the many aspects. It, it's ultimately soluble. I mean, you have laws, it could be technological ways to, to help preserve uh, privacy um, and lack of uh, misuse of data. But we haven't really gotten, you know, the, the technology is way ahead of uh, the, the legal and ethical aspects that need to catch up. And the thing I, uh, I worry about is the company that promises it won't sell my data, won't use my data. How do I know? I mean, what would yeah. be the, yeah. what's the, you know, I, I like the Reagan uh, rule, trust, but verify. How, right. how, I like trusting. I'm all for it. But how do I verify that? <laughs> and that's why I think the only model that works is ownership. You own your data. And if you want to sell it, okay, it's great. If you want to share it for a, re a research study, great. And if you want to uh, participate in or, or just have co-production of your health care with a doctor or a health system, fine. But if you are in control of it, you own it, then that's the – otherwise, I, I don't know how we're going to get to the, the trust plus verify mode. Uh, and we've already seen in the non-medical sphere, you know, how our data are, are, are being brokered and sold left and right and uh, that's just unacceptable. You know, you might get away with that with things that are not material, but there's nothing more precious about your data than your your health, your conditions, the medications you're taking. You really don't want that out uh, on the Internet. A lot of people, of course, are worried about, they call it monopoly. It's not literally monopoly, but the market power that, that large firms have that do collect a lot of data from us. And it seems to me a lot of other people have noticed, I'm not the only one, that the traditional antitrust solutions, these problems aren't really, don't seem relevant. They seem literally orthogonal to, to what the issues are. Uh, I think we ought to be looking at changing the regulatory legal environment for, of property rights and ownership of that data. And then if people want to sell their data and break profit from it and force, that would force these large companies to share their gains with their so-called customers, which in fact, it's their, um, or not their customers a lot of the time. We're just their <laughs> Where their inputs it's or a, their prey, yeah. depending on how you I look don't at it. I want to say it. that, yeah. but yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to be neutral. Um, I'm get. I'm, I'm drifting into a bad place. I'm worried, but uh, you mentioned the potential for hospitals becoming obsolete. You mentioned that hospitals, I think, are about a third of our medical costs right now. They don't go literally just to the hospital. They go to the doctors in the hospital. But the the hospital structure is a huge, uh, formidable 
barrier to innovation in my mind. Why do you think there's a chance they could become obsolete and how would that happen and why would it potentially be a good thing? Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think there's a question that it will happen. It's just a matter of when. So we have the ability now to provide exquisite monitoring through sensors as good or better than an intensive care unit. Uh, and all we need is to get remote uh, uh, patient bedroom, not in the hospital, to replace this and prove that people are safely looked after in their own home. That would be immensely uh, cost-saving because the average hospital stay in the U.S. is a charge of $5,000 and a uh, a, a true cost of at least half that much. And then you have the risks that are uh, involved in a hospital room. We're not talking about an intensive care unit, but the regular hospital room, uh, these people have a one in four chance of being harmed, particularly through gay, acquiring an infection, a serious so-called nosocomial uh, infection in the hospital setting. So to be able to get people in the comfort of their own home uh, at a more safe environment, with uh, continuous monitoring, you know, during the time when they're when they're ill, instead of replacing the time they'd be sitting lying in a hospital uh, room, this is something that is eminently achievable, and it just is a problem in that it challenges this critical aspect, as you said, about a third of our healthcare budget each year in the U.S. So, uh, taking it on with such vested interest, so little is being done. Amazingly to replace hospitals. Uh, you can only imagine why. Uh, and I also would add that we're not talking about getting rid of operating rooms and intensive care units and emergency rooms or, or imaging suites. We're talking about the vast, the bulk of a hospital, which is regular rooms. And they are really unnecessary. And we should be making the movement to, to eradicate their need. But interestingly, Russ, at the same time we're talking, there's new hospitals that are being built that are, yeah, you know, an enormous number of rooms. But some of that cost, I would think a significant part of the cost is the technology inside that room. And you'd have to replicate a good chunk of it in the bedroom of that patient that you're, you want to keep at home. How, how's that going to work and, and still be able to save costs? No, I mean, I think it's basically you get a wrist sensor. There's a couple that have been approved now uh, for home use. And you continuously monitor vital signs. And I mean, if you want to have uh, machine vision with a webcam, basically you have that deep phenotyping of that person, understanding everything about that person, all their conditions, their medications. You're now getting all their sensor data. And you're getting an alert as to whether there's a problem that's arising predicted to arise before it happens. And so that alerts at, at a center, a virtual center, like we, we already have seen operational in St. Louis at Mercy Hospital, where they have, a, they have a, a, a virtual medical center with no patients in it. And so that gets rid of um, the need for all these rooms. And at any given site, you could have uh, doctors and nurses monitoring patients at a, a scale at very low cost because it's basically using AI for each patient to have uh, their data continuously uh, updated uh, and uh, alerts that have to be uh, reacted to in case there is any sense that the patient is starting to have uh, a decompensation or a risk. So it seems to me that for a lot of us, um, incorrectly, but for a lot of us, the hospital is a haven. Uh, it's it's where we get to when we're and once we get there, we're safe. Uh, you know, in the movie, the, the ambulance is racing to the emergency room. You know, whether it's the pregnant wife or the accident victim or the terrorist victim, and, and once you're in the hospital, you're okay. Because in the TV show, you know, House is there, and and Mr. House, and, and he's going to diagnose you, and he's going to his doctors and colleagues will stitch you up and give you the magic pills and the the fabulous operation that's going to remove the thing or whatever it is, and then you're going to be okay. It, of course, that, a lot of times that's true. The flip side of that is that one out of four times you're going to get a life-ending, potentially life-ending infection there. Uh, so there are people who view the hospital as a, a last place to go. But it just seems to be psychologically that human touch is really important. So I wanted to 
let's shift to the last part of the book where you talk about the role of empathy in medicine. And although I'm intrigued by the idea of the home monitoring, uh, the human touch seems essential, physically touch even sometimes, as you emphasize in your in your chapter on this. So talk about why empathy is so important and how you see that interacting with a world of so much more uh, data, cold, un- inhuman machinery, data, monitoring, sensors, et cetera. Right. Well, just to round out our hospital uh, discussion, I, I will hasten to add that George Orwell called the hospital the antechamber to the tomb. Yeah. <laughs> And also that, you know, there isn't that much human contact of doctors because they don't have time. So they on rounds, you know, they would just step in to see a patient, maybe say a few words, very little in the way of exam and meaningful interaction. So that, of course, could be achieved through other means. Uh, and, you know, we'll get to that. But getting to the, the empathy, the deep empathy and the potential for all this efficiency, productivity, keyboard liberation, uh, the patient taking more charge. Every way you look at it, you've got ability to decompress the current lives of doctors so they have more time to think, to interact, to listen. And you know, one thing, a patient's story, the life story, that'll never get digitized. I mean, that's something you really want to listen to and and pick up all the nonverbal cues. And you know, there isn't just time for that today. So when you add up all these things like reestablishing trust takes time, presence, that is that you're actually looking at the patient and talking with them and doing a real exam rather than a pseudo exam or something cursory. Patients want to be examined and they know when the stethoscope is being put on the outside of the, you know, clothes that that's not a real heart exam. And they, they're they just uh, disappointed that the doctor's not taking the time to do it right. So no matter how you look at it is if you have time and productivity, potentially this could be turned back to the patient doctor relationship and it could reestablish where healthcare, what it was meant to be, where it used to be. I mean, when I graduated medical school 40 years ago, it was there, there was a precious relationship. There was an intense uh, trust and human bond, not always, but characteristically. And that's, of course, the era of Marcus Welby, who was kind of the icon for all that. Well, now we don't have that. We've lost our way. We've got all the burnout. We've got patients who are disenchanted because they feel they don't feel like they're cared for. But we have a mechanism now to get that back, which we may not see ever again, or at least for generations, because we've not ever seen something that has this much potential. And so... The the problem, Russ, is as you can see through quickly that it could go used the wrong way. It could be taken down further by having more productivity. Well, okay, go see more patients, go read more scans and slides. And if that happens, that would be the ultimate disappointment that this technology was not used to restore care in healthcare. Yeah, to me, the dark side is there's a kiosk. But it's also the bright side because it'll be cheap. You walk into the kiosk, you close the door, you talk to the robot, the computer, the thing that looks like a human but isn't. You tell your problems to it. It decides you've got a an ulcer, and it get tell it dispenses the the antibiotic right there, and then uh, everything's great. Except one of the things we've learned, and it it just shines through in your book. It it, it almost incidentally. I mean, you mention it, but it, it it just can't bear enough mentioning. So many times in your book, there's stories, I think there's at least three, where a human being makes contact with another human being and transforms them, certainly emotionally, spiritually, humanly, but also medically even. And that empathy, that human connection is a crucial part of the medical experience. And we suspect that's part of why the placebo effect is so important and so significant in, in, uh, in medicine. Oh, there isn't any question of it. I mean, a study after study in the placebo uh, science shows that, you know, it's that interaction with the doctor. Even if the doctor says this is a placebo, it has no action, but it's that human touch, the human factor. That is what medicine is all about. That is why we went into medicine, which is we want to care for people. And we've been uh, made uh, unable or impaired in trying to execute that charge. 
that that privilege, if you will. So that w- is something that is so deep and important that we we're looking at a potential to get that back. And uh, no matter how you look at it, the, medicine is a human touch, human factor story that's lost its way. And I don't know of any other ways we can get it back, but it's going to be requiring a lot of activism. Uh, it's not going to happen by accident. Uh, eventually, though, we'll see whether doctors can rise up and say, I, I demand this time be turned inward, that I have t- time with my patients so that we can go after the things that are important. Now, you're getting to that kiosk model or the unimportant things. I mean, like today in the UK, you can go into a, a, a drugstore and you have your UTI diagnosed with AI and get a prescription, just kind of urinary, like you, urinary uh, tract infection. Yeah, it's urinary tract, which is a common medical problem. It's not serious. It's doctorless diagnosed and treated. And so we're going to see a lot more of those things like ear infections for kids and skin lesions and rashes and the list goes on and on. And that, again, will decompress the need for the uh, the in-person appointment. It's much more efficient. It's a lot much less costly. And so we can get that time back, which is the essence, that gift of time to pave the way for bringing back relationships. But if we don't use that, if we don't achieve those uh, the, the, the relationships, uh, then we will just go down in a spiral uh, course that we're on right now. Well, as an economist, it strikes me that the incentives to move to that more humane model aren't there. Um, and I, I would suggest, drawing on my extensive bias against uh, the way that the current medical system is structured and um, the lack of feedback loops, the lack of skin in the game for uh, what should be the ultimate skin in the game. The fact that most money is being paid for by a third party, just a, such a strange convoluted system. Uh, I think it it's really hard to get there from here. And I, I, I think there's a way. Tell me, it, tell me. Yeah, yeah. It's going to take the unionization of doctors. Uh, and the reason I say that is, you know, we don't have that, such a thing now. Uh, the AMA, which is the largest, is uh, not a union of doctors to help patients. It's a it's a self-serving organization, which is only representing less than a fourth of doctors who are in practice. So we don't have all we have is a bunch of trade guilds and we have no entity that wants to stand up for patients. If we had that, it, it could take on you know this mission. And I believe that ultimately that could be formed. And that would promote activism. And the reason I say that, Russ, is you remember recently uh, that the uh, National Rifle Association went after doctors and they say, stay, stay in your lane. And the doctors came back like I've never seen in, in my career. And they came back with, this is our lane. And it was solidarity I have never seen. OK, and over, the doctors, over the right okay. over the right to ask a patient where they have a gun in the house. Which, yeah. Right. Which I find I also, I find intrusive, offensive and outside their lane. But OK, at least they rose up together as one. Good. Yeah. Well, what, what, that's the point is that for the first time ever, really, we saw the passion and the, you know, posting of pictures of doctors splattered with blood of floors and emergency room flooded with blood. And, you know, all the passion came out and you saw now that doctors can rise. They can rally to work together for a common cause. And Social media help that. I think we can do that. If we don't do that, whether it's with a formal union organization, which is solely for this purpose, not for, you know, having better reimbursement or other matters that are typically picked up by trade guilds, uh, then then we might get there. The irony to me as an outsider in this field looking in is that a lot of this is driven by what are, what are called nonprofits. Um uh, the hospital system uh, by doctors who are human beings who like money, like everybody else, but like to think that they're in it for higher causes. And of course they are, but the money is in there too. Uh, most doctors don't want to work for nothing. I get it. Uh, they make huge sacrifices to acquire the knowledge that we rely on uh, and draw on. So I, I don't have any problem with doctors getting really rich, but it seems to me the only the way this would happen, I'm I'm not a big fan of the unionization. Let me let me suggest another model, and you can tell me what's <laughs> okay. what's wrong with it. 
Good. So sometime in the past, a, a young man, uh, I don't know how old he was, started the Cleveland Clinic. And that was you. Um, you're not as young as you were then. But let's say you started another, uh, we'll put it, let's put it in San Diego or La Jolla. We'll put, you're in La Jolla right now. So we'll call it the La Jolla Clinic. And the La Jolla Clinic would have a, a motto that would be uh, very different than the uh, at least uh, actual mottos of, of most hospitals, which is maximize how many people you see and drive the revenue, the bottom line, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, it's going to have trouble competing in a certain dimension with the current set of options. So it would have to draw on probably some philanthropic support. But I suspect there are an enormous number of very large uh, foundations that would be excited to see the kind of model that you're talking about. And you take that clinic and you would – be a champion and and uh, inspirer of these kinds of cultural differences in how patients are treated, and you change the world. Now, of course, that's happening right now on a very, very small level for really rich people who can afford a boutique experience and still get more than those 12 minutes and seven-minute appointments. We just need a full, bigger data set and more people. Well, but the other problem is that you know if you look outside the U.S., you see countries that are far more efficient and and have are eager to adopt AI, like in the UK where I uh, led their NHS review and planning for the next 20 years and in China. But the point, I guess, is we're at a desperate moment uh, in economics of healthcare because we have the worst outcomes in the U.S. By, for at least two to threefold expenditures. I mean, this is if there was ever a broken business model, this is it. So we need a new solution. And, you know, whether you start, uh, you know, clinics like as you're uh, projecting, that's not going to, of course, deal with this at the national scale. But watching other countries that are embracing, that are planning, that are incorporating, implementing the things that we've been talking about uh, today um, you know, they're going to show that they're revving up their efficiency and their their productivity is going to be enhanced because that's what these tools provide. So we have no plan in the U.S. We have an executive order of uh, an AI initiative, the American AI initiative that was announced in February without one dollar of new resources and without any committee or expert planning or anything. So we're, we are behind almost all of the uh, major countries in the world right now that are using this to come up with a better business model for how they can deliver health care, potentially restore the care, the human element, uh, at, at a fraction of the cost uh, per individual as today. Well, I don't – I have a different perspective. It's, that's – you know, we're near the end of our conversation, so we're not going to open this Pandora's box. But I do want to mention that it's true we spend a lot more than – many, many, almost every country. It's true we have, on some dimensions, worse outcomes. Some of those outcomes are complicated by the fact that our population is not like their population. And I think I'm going to guess, but maybe you'll disagree, that if you had a complicated medical situation, you'd rather be treated in La Jolla than in London uh, as part of the NHS. Now, that might not be true if you're a poor person, and uh, that's uh, it, it unacceptable. We can debate how the best to fix that. But I think some of the international comparisons are misleading. Do you worry about that? I thought that just like you articulated, Russ, before I spent quite a bit of time in the UK. And then I started realizing that the care they were delivering without all the rabbit hole incidental illness uh, that can hurt people uh, and the quality of care uh, was excellent. And that explained to me why their outcomes are better at a third of the per individual cost to the country. So I, I, I understand you're, you're, you're uh, demonstrating the kind of uh, the party mind of that we have such great uh, health care uh, outcomes and, you know, you, the U.S. is uh, superior. I, I, I used to think that. And now I have a different view. I also think that we have the mechanism, the ability to to be the world leader in delivery of health care. But we have so many, you know, malincentives that get in the way that that are formidable. And can we override them? Uh, uh, you know, it's possible. I mean, 
talking to uh, a noted uh, person in economics uh, from a, from me who has no background in that area. Of course, I'm I'm definitely not going to uh, uh, come out with the, the leading light uh, ideas. But it just is challenging the status quo that we've watched erosion of care, uh, worsening of outcomes at higher costs and relative to any other model uh, in the world. Something needs to be done to really rethink what we're doing. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. Um, I, I think we waste an enormous amount of money. Um, we are extremely innovative because we pay for all these innovations out of other people's with other people's money that the other rest of the world often enjoys. Uh, I would just mention in passing that you know, my, my friends in London who are American don't feel the same way you do about the, 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 the NHS, but maybe they come with their own biases about, you know, they want to get all the tests. You don't get them in, in England. <laughs> they no, don't, you got to be bleeding or have a bone sticking out before, before they'll take care of you. And there's some advantages to that. I get it. And our culture just not easily uh, takes to that. So they don't have very many MRIs, the, the advantages they don't waste a lot of. They don't find a lot of incidental lomas. The disadvantage is they miss some stuff because there's a longer waiting list and so on. But I'm, you know, I'm. I don't deny the reality that our current system is atrociously uh, uh, has atrocious incentives uh, for spending too much money with very little return. And I, I do think we need to do something different. The question is, you know, how do we get there from here? And and I don't. Tell me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's a lot of face-to-face -face long periods of, of doctor-patient interaction in, in the rest of the world either. So some of that oh, is just no, a universal so, problem. Right, and that's where the AI tools that we've discussed could could certainly uh, lead to improvements there. I mean, that's essential. That That's medicine uh, at a global level uh, that is deficient in, in time. I mean, in Asia, in many parts of Asia, it's two minutes in an appointment instead of seven. So, you know, we, it has to get better. But just getting back to the, the UK model, um, because in the US, as you know, life expectancy has decreased three years in a row. It's, un, it's never, since that's been charted for well over a century, that's never been the case of any country having less life expectancy three years in a row. And at the same time, the UK is increasing like most, like every other country, increasing life expectancy. So just to your point about things are being missed, well, they must not be too important if they're not having any effect uh, on life expectancy. So, you know, we, we, we've got to address this and have, I think, an open mind that our model is, is hurting people somehow. Well, again, I, I would just mention respectfully that there are many other things going on in the United States that aren't going on elsewhere. We have too easy access to opioids. Uh, yes. We yes. have a big country with lots of cars and inexpensive gasoline, so we kill a lot of people in our cars. Uh, we hope to make some headway against that. We have women delivering babies at much later ages because we subsidize fertility treatments that they don't. And most of those things are tricky for us to, quote, fix. They're they're you know, there's trade-offs there that uh, I think a lot of Americans would, would not be in favor of. But you're right. We can do a lot better. I, I think that's uh, that's undeniable. You know, I take your point about the need for risk adjustment, different populations. But it's sobering to look at that, um, you agree. know, to see this data. And I, I think that, you know, you've referred to so much of our embedded problems of, you know, with the the insurance companies and the, the, all the different perverse incentives. If we can somehow work our way through this, where we are truly patient centric, and that you know get back to the basics here. What are we doing all this for? It's for the promoting health of of our people. Uh, you know that that would be a fundamental uh, axiom that I I hope uh, again uh, that the the tools of AI that lay before us they really can make a difference if we develop this properly. I want to close with a personal question. If you don't want to answer it, I'll, I'll take this out of the, uh, out of the uh, final recording. Um, you strike me as an extremely empathetic person. Could be a show. Could be a facade. Uh, it, it, it screams out of your interactions with me uh, in email, over the conversation we're having, in your book. Um, and I think 
one of the things I learned from your book is that I'm a big fan of conversation. We're having one now. Um, I think we learn as humans from conversation. And reading your book made me think that medical students would benefit from a course on how to have a conversation and not just like an ethics class, which I think is maybe not so valuable, but at least uh, it's maybe better than nothing. I don't know. But I'm curious what your thoughts on how to train people to be empathetic. And if you think you have any understanding of why you're the way you are, is it, uh, is it genetic? Did somebody influence you as a young, younger man to be more empathetic as a, as a physician? You seem remarkably humble and I haven't even listed your professional accomplishments at any length um, in my introduction earlier. So do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it's a great question. And I, I don't, I, I do feel that I uh, can um, have that connect with other people and patients. Uh, that, that just, that's a real big part of me. And I, the question that I grappled with in the deep empathy chapter is, can that be nurtured? Can that be trained? I, I do think you're getting at a, a fundamental a point about this, which is um, people with emotional intelligence at high level that really can read other people, you know, through nonverbal cues and feel the the what's going on in other people as as they try to express themselves and what worries them and what what excites them. So, uh, you know, I think that in the future, if we want to get medicine at the highest level uh, of uh, human uh, contact, uh, human bonds, we want to really foster, select the people who have this high empathy quotient, uh, empathy factor. And that isn't how we pick people today to become doctors. They're largely, you know, finding the brainiacs, finding the people with the best test scores and the best grade point averages in college and that sort of thing. Whereas I think because we can outsource so much of what used to be the case uh, that required the mind of the doctor, a lot of that's going to be done through machine support. So I, I hope that we can uh, find the people who, uh, whether it's genetic, whether it's the way they were brought up by their, by their, their family, um, whatever it is, uh, is probably some a complex admixture, but that, that it's there. I'm not sure that you can train, you can get trained people to listen, but to some extent they have to have that in them before they go on the road of, of being a, a real uh, important uh, listener clinician. You, you, you probably just can't um, have a course in that. Uh, so we'll see. But I, I think there's, an, there's some embedded qualities that um, we can select for. My guest today has been Eric Topol. His book is Deep Medicine. Eric, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, I really enjoyed it, Russ. Thank you for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.